We're going to jump into our Bible study, uh, Luke chapter 2. We left off last week. Uh, as we were getting into this story, you'll remember that the angel comes to Mary, and I put this there on your outline, but the angel comes to Mary in uh, chapter 1, and uh, having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice Highly favored, I've underlined that one. The Lord is with you. Uh, blessed are you among women. And uh, so you remember from last week, the message that the angel gives to Mary is that Mary, you're going to have a child and uh, you're gonna be a virgin. So it's gonna be by the Holy Spirit. And this is going to be the Christ child. And you'll recall from last week, we mentioned that Mary is somewhere between 12 and 14 years of age at that point. She's engaged to a man named Joseph, who's also probably very, very young. Um, in those days in the Middle East, 2,000 years ago, they did not have dating as we understand it. All marriages were arranged. Um, they were not forced marriages, but they were arranged marriages. So you would live in these small villages and, and uh, you know, all the kids would play together and the families knew each other. And, and so the, the parents would get together and say, you know, I think it'd be a great thing if, if uh, you know, our kids got married and, and, uh, and if the kids agreed to it, the kids had to agree to it, then, uh, you know, that would certainly strengthen the family ties. So Mary has agreed to marry Joseph. Joseph has agreed to marry um, Mary. And so a year before they come together as husband and wife, they are, we would say, engaged in English, but in that culture, they are legally married. And what that meant is once they had agreed to this, there was a ceremony that was involved, but, but in, in order to break the engagement at this point, it would require a, a certificate of divorce. And so the engaged couple, uh, this, the, this engagement period could not go any longer than one year. So in that year, the daughter would stay with her family, and then the, the son, the groom-to-be, would stay with his family, and what he would do is he would add on to his father's house so that he would then be able to go and bring his bride back to his father's house. And so there's a lot of end times uh, symbolism in there, and that's where all that comes from. So it's in this time period where they are in that year time period before they come together as husband and wife, but they're legally married in that culture that the angel appears to Mary and says, Mary, you're going to have a baby. This is going to be by the Holy Spirit. Mary is favored by the Lord. She's blessed with the Lord. The Lord is with her. But we noticed last week that the angel does not reveal what's going on to the rest of the, the community. And so as Mary begins to show, the rumors begin to fly Joseph, who is engaged to Mary, decides to put her away privately. He's decided to divorce her at this point. He apparently does not believe what we would call, uh, at this point, the, the virgin conception story. So uh, he doesn't believe that she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He just knows that, that she's pregnant. He loves her, but he just can't live with a woman who's been unfaithful to him. So apparently he doesn't believe the story early on. Fortunately, the angel appears to him also there on your outline. It says, but after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, that's going to be important for our story, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So there's no angelic explanation given to the rest of the community. Mary is highly favored. She's blessed of the Lord. The Lord is with her. So the question is, what does it mean in Mary's situation to be blessed of the Lord, highly favored, and to have the Lord with her? So I want you to write down a few things very quickly as we go through this. First of all, Mary's blessing is going to involve uh, an unplanned pregnancy. She's going to be 12 to 14 years of age. She's not planning to have a baby. She's planning on getting married. She's uh, you know, thinking about that, but here she is. She's pregnant. We would look on and we would say, write this down, it's bad timing. Yes, it's from God, but we'd say, you know, but Mary, you have your whole life ahead of you. And, and uh, when we get to next week's teaching, we'll see that they weren't really financially prepared to have a baby at this time. And again, she's planning a wedding, but she's not actually planning to, to uh, have a baby. So we'd say, well, it's, it's bad timing. Well, then in addition to that, 
this blessing is going to mean a ruined reputation. And you want to write that down, a ruined reputation. The angel does not appear to everyone. The local people do not buy the whole virgin conception story. And even 30 years later, this rumor is going around that, that Mary had, had had an improper relationship. We talked about this last week. When Jesus grows up, he's in an argument with the religious leadership. And uh, they're losing the argument, but they know his hot button, what to, what to push. And so they take the shot at his mama there on your outline from last week. He says, you're doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born as a result of sexual immorality. And and so they knew exactly what to say. And if you've read that, you know from what we said last week, Jesus says, you want to talk about my mama? Let's talk about your daddy. And uh, begins to say, your daddy's the devil and uh, it's not going to go well for you. But there was no angelic explanation to the rest of the community, to the family or anybody else. And so there was this rumor that circulated that Mary had met up with a Roman soldier and he got her pregnant. And so even 30 years later, she's still dealing with this reputation. So the local community does not embrace what we would call the virgin conception story. And uh, apparently neither does the family. So what this is also going to mean for her, and you want to write this down, it's going to mean rejection from family, rejection from family. And it's going to say in John's gospel that even his own brothers did not believe in him. So Mary is going to have other sons, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they did not believe in Jesus early on. It actually, from what we gathered, they don't believe in Jesus until he's raised from the dead. But but think this through. If uh, you have brothers and they don't believe in you, it it would imply that um, if they believed that Mary got pregnant by the Holy Spirit, then they would have to believe that there's something very special about Jesus. But they don't believe there's something very special about Jesus. And so it's assumed that they don't believe that Mary actually got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, they had grown up in synagogue being told that when the Messiah comes, he would be born of a virgin. We talked about that last week. But they look at their mom and they go, not our mom. So apparently they didn't believe the virgin conception story either. And so the locals didn't buy it. The family didn't buy it. And in that very religious culture, this would represent for Mary, and you want to write this down, a significant health threat to the mother, a significant health threat to the mother. You see, they believed that Mary had had a physical relationship with a man. And uh, there was this rule from the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, and it says this. If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Well, at this time, Mary is legally married. We say engagement, but she was legally married to to Joseph. And now she's pregnant. And so they would claim that she was in an adulterous relationship. And so if they're going to put you to death, we would call that a significant health threat to the mother. Would you agree with that? Yeah, death is definitely a significant health threat. So Mary has all of the reasons that in our society we would look on and we would say, you know, um, Mary, you need to terminate this, this pregnancy. But here's what we know that, that uh, they didn't know. We know that God has a great plan for this baby. God has a plan for every baby. As a matter of fact, we're told in the book of Psalms, there in your outline, David says, you formed me, you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book, they were all written. The days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. So God has it all planned out. There's a plan. We're not to step in and change that plan. God has a plan for this baby. But Mary would have had all the reasons that our society would have said, well, you should just terminate the, the pregnancy. So as our story picks up, nine months have passed since the angel spoke to Mary. And in verses one and two of chapter two, uh, I will, we'll read through, we'll make some comments, and then we'll keep moving on. Verse one. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. 
So Caesar gets this idea that he thinks is a uh, original idea. He wants to have a census of the world so that he can tax everybody. That'll be important. Originally, he was called Caesar Octavian. But in 27 BC, the Roman Senate agrees to change his name to Caesar Augustus. Augustus there on your outline means increased or augmented. Uh, so in their thinking, this would mean he is now Caesar augmented. He is like a God and he believes that he is a God and they will actually worship him as a God. So he thinks he's a God. So that's the starting point. Verse three, and everyone was on his way to register for the census eats to his own city. And that would be the city that you had your ancestry from. Joseph also went up from Galilee to from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. Verse five, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. So um, nine months have gone by since the angel has appeared to Mary. It's quite possible that she's had a birthday in that time period. So she could be 13 to 15 years of age at this point. Everybody has to go to their city of origin. Both Mary and, and Joseph are descendants of King David about a thousand years before. So Joseph has to go on a 90 mile walk all the way down to Bethlehem. So just to give some perspective, let's uh, put a map up. You have in the northern part of Israel, you have the area called Galilee. And of course, that's where the Sea of Galilee is, which is a large freshwater lake. It's about um, eight miles across and 13 miles long. Nazareth is about 15 miles away from, from uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Galilee. And uh, there in the middle of Israel, you have this area that's called Samaria. Now, who lives in Samaria? Samaritans. Okay, so you're a little bolder than you were last week. You're like, you're like we, we don't, we're not so sure. So you have the Samaritans, and they live in the middle part of Israel. So if you were Jewish, you wouldn't, you, what you would do is you would walk around Samaria, because Jewish people and Samaritans, they didn't really mix. And so then you'd come down. And there's some, you know, hills and, and all that. Uh, you come down to Jerusalem, and, uh, which is in the area of Judea. That's the southern part of Israel. And about four to six miles south of Jerusalem is this tiny little village called Bethlehem. So you want to write down that Bethlehem is about three to five acres in size. It's much larger now, but 2,000 years ago it was about three to five acres. So, so here's Mary. She's in her ninth month of pregnancy. And God has to get Mary to go all the way from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem in order to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy, which comes from the prophet Micah. And so there on your outline, Micah told us where Jesus would be born. And this is about 700 years before Jesus is born. And it says this, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, now Ephrathah just means fruitfulness, and I put that there on your outline. There's a big conversation. We're not going to spend time on that, but, but fruitfulness. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, about three to five acres or so, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, which is a, uh, a, a, a kingdom on the earth, by the way, uh, whose goings forth are from old. Well, how old? Well, from everlasting, from everlasting. So a couple of things. First of all, they knew that this Messiah, the Christ, would one day be born, but he had to be born in this tiny little town of Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is a compound word from the Hebrew, Bethlehem, and there in your outline, it just means house of bread, house of bread, which is interesting because um, Jesus will be born there but he will also be known as, there on your outline, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So the one who's going to be the bread of life will literally be born in the house of bread. And it says that he's existed from, from everlasting. Now, in their minds, God is the only one who would be existent from everlasting. So this is their way of understanding. God will be born here. Yes, he's going to be born as a baby but he's been in existence from everlasting. So God says, Mary, 
you're favored, you know, you're blessed, rejoice, you know, and, and uh, God's with you. But so far, it's meant an unplanned pregnancy, a ruined reputation. Not everybody understands. The angel doesn't appear to everyone. And so she's nine months pregnant, and God says, so I've got to get you to Bethlehem, and it's a mere 90-mile walk all the way down. You're going to go over some hills, and, you know, it's going to be kind of, you know, difficult, and the, but you're nine months pregnant, so you get to walk, but if you get uncomfortable, maybe we can get you a donkey or something that you can ride on. And after all, if you're nine months pregnant, what's more comfortable than riding on a donkey, right? So, so this, is, this is what Mary, Mary has to do. So I would suggest, and ladies, you got to help me out on this one. I would, I would say that Mary's probably not feeling all that blessed of the Lord right now. Would, would you agree with that? that? That would make sense. Okay, so God realizes that Mary might not agree to voluntarily walk all the way down to Bethlehem when she's nine months or eight months pregnant in that time. So Caesar Augustus, who thinks he's a god, he gets what he thinks is this original idea. He goes, this is so brilliant. And he says, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have a census. I'm gonna have everybody go back to their, their town that they came from, their ancestors come from. We're gonna create a census so that we can tax everybody. He goes, I'm, I'm so brilliant. But what hits me is that, is that he doesn't have the idea the year before. He doesn't have the idea the year after, but he has it at just the right time when Mary is going to need to go from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem. That tells us something, and you wanna write this down that God works supernaturally through natural ways. God works supernaturally through natural ways. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in each step that they make. So here's God working behind the scenes, doing something, literally rearranging the whole world to get her down to Bethlehem. Mary's probably not feeling all that blessed of the Lord right now or favored by the Lord. And she's probably asking the question, why do I have to go through this? I mean, why? I, mean, I, I thought you said I was favored. I was blessed. God was with me. Her situation is beyond her control, and she probably wouldn't go if, if Caesar didn't say, everybody has to go. As a Christian, and for those of you who've been around a while, here, here's what you'll learn, that sometimes God is using those difficult situations, circumstances in our life that we don't understand, we can't fix, we don't know why we're going through it, and, and it's not until after we go through that that we're able to look back and say, oh, that's what you were doing, that's what you're doing. And I think that she's going to see that later on. So don't be surprised as a believer that there's a time that you walk through a circumstance. You know what God's word says, you're favored, you're blessed, he loves you, but it doesn't feel that way right now. It's only going to be after that you look back and you go, God, that's what you were doing in my life. And that's for all of us. We, we would all, we've all been there. Well, verse six, it says, now while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him, I have, she wrapped him in claws, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So the first thing we notice is there's no room for them in the inn. Now, if you're like me, and I grew up in church, we would watch these movies of, of the birth of Jesus. And so the, the movies typically went like this. Mary and Joseph, they come into town and uh, they've got a donkey and Joseph goes up to the door of the inn and it's all brightly lit on the inside and everybody's just having a good time, you know, and they're all eating and drinking. It's just a good time. And Joseph says, can I, can I come in? And they go, we have, we have no room. And so he and Mary, they go like this, and then they just kind of walk away. Now, did you, did, have you seen movies like that? Okay, so yeah. So if you have, then, then you get this. Here's the thing. Um, that's not actually what happened. Because um, in, this is the Middle East 2,000 years ago. This is Nazareth. Bethlehem, it's a town of about three to five acres. They didn't have tourism as we understand it. So when they said in, it wasn't for people to come and stay, get a room, you know, have a meal, that sort of thing. That, that, it, you might have something like that in a large town, like in Jerusalem, but not in these tiny little towns of three to five acres. So what would it be? 
Well, in Bethlehem, in these tiny little towns, an inn would be a four-walled structure, and it would be for if you were a shepherd and you were out in the field, and you'd been out in the field for a couple of weeks, and you just need a good night's sleep, you would bring your sheep into the, the village. The sheep would go into, it's more like a barn. They would be on the inside. You would sleep at the door. Your sheep would be on the inside. They would be safe, and you could get a, a good night's sleep. And so that's the idea. So it's not the inn like, like we, they didn't have Holiday Inn or something like that. So, so keep that in mind. But uh, apparently everybody's in from out of town. So they're using this at this time to house people because they have to take the sense, census. Now, the, the part that we miss as we go through this is this is not just the Middle East, but this is Israel. This is Israel. And Mary is a pregnant woman. And in Israel, a pregnant woman, because children are a gift from the Lord, in that religious culture, they would do anything to accommodate a pregnant woman. But this pregnant woman shows up, and nobody will do anything to accommodate her. So they go, well, there's no room for you here. It suggested that Mary's reputation of being an immoral woman has preceded her, and, and they just they, they won't make room for her. Now, we are told from the last chapter in what we looked at a few, few moments ago that Joseph is from the house of David. That is, he's a descendant of King David about a thousand years before. Mary also from the last chapter, she also is a descendant of David. Now, the part that we miss is that if Joseph had to go down and he had to be registered because he's a descendant of David, well, wouldn't the rest of his family have to go down and be registered because they're descendants of David too? But they're not part of the story here. Mary also is from the house of David and her family would have had to go down and be registered also there in Bethlehem. But their families are going to be glaringly absent from the, the, the story. So it is held that they believe that Mary is just a great embarrassment to the family and they've kind of disowned her at this point. So they're gonna be not part of, of being, being there. So she gives birth in verse seven, it says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths. Now, typically what happened, again, in Israel, uh, when a woman would go into labor, the rest of the neighborhood would hear about it. And uh, so as they would hear about, about that, all the women within earshot of, of the woman going to labor would then drop what they're doing and then they would come and they would assist the woman who's giving birth. Well, here, um, what we find is it says that she wrapped him in cloths. Now, typically what would happen is the woman would give birth, the women who were assisting would then take the baby, clean the baby, and then they would wrap the baby in cloths and then hand the baby back, back to the mother. That's typically what happened. So in this world where uh, when a woman went into labor, every woman within earshot would then uh, drop everything and come and help the woman, what we find is that Mary here is giving birth alone. So the idea is that there's a reason why the women didn't come and help her. Uh, it's, it's, it's held that because they had hurt her reputation, they don't want anything to do with this woman, so she's gonna be on her own. Well, then verse seven again, it says, she gave birth to her firstborn, she wrapped him in claws and laid him in a manger. Now, if you're like me and you grew up in church and you saw the manger scenes, um, we thought that the manger was sort of like, you know, this, this whole, whole thing. But the manger, actually, there on your outline, just means to eat a crib for fodder. I mean, it can translate as manger or stall. Literally, it's a feeding trough. So she lays him in a feeding trough. That's what the manger is. So we would look on and we would say the, this feeding trough is not a great place for a baby to be laid in. It doesn't say he was born in a manger. It says he was laid in a manger. So she takes Jesus after he's born and lays him in this feeding trough. So it's not a great place for a baby, but it's a great place for a lamb, which is interesting because 30 some years later, 30 years later, Jesus is, is walking, John the Baptist sees him and it says the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sin of the world. So it's not a great place for a baby, but a great place for a lamb, and he would be known as the Lamb of God. Well, verse seven, it says, she gave birth to her firstborn. Now, when it says firstborn, you wanna write this down, it implies that there will be more. There will be more, more than one baby, which is why in another gospel in Matthew, it would say, Joseph kept her a virgin until, and you wanna underline that word, until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Well, we would hold from our, our church background that when uh, Mary gives birth to Jesus, after that, uh, they began to have very normal relations. And like any good Jewish girl in that culture, she begins to start popping out babies. So how many babies did Mary start popping out? Well, interesting, um, in Matthew's gospel, it will say this. It says, is this not the carpenter's son, the people are asking, is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Now, when it says Judas, this is not Judas Iscariot. Judas was a common name, comes from Judah. And so that we would just say Judah. And then it says, and his sisters, and that's in the plural. So he has four brothers and at least two sisters. It's in the plural in the Greek and also in the English. Are they not all with us? And then where then did this man get all these things? So Jesus grows up in a family that has at least seven kids. He's a sibling, and so there's at least seven kids in his family. And so I just want to say that if you grow up in a family and you have seven siblings, six siblings, all these siblings, and you grow up without sin, then truly you are the son of God. So, <laughs> would you agree with that? Yes. Amen. I know that some of us come from a tradition that holds that Mary was perpetually a virgin, that they never had relations. The, the problem with that, that is a tradition, but you can't get there from your Bible because the Bible speaks very clearly that, that, that they did. Well, Mary is blessed. She's favored of God. She walks 90 miles to give birth alone. We would look on and we say, Mary, you're just, you're too young for this. I mean, 14, 13, 14, 15 years old, you give birth alone. And I think the hardest part of this is that all this is happening. The family's not embracing and, and God hasn't spoken to Mary in nine months. There's nothing recorded that God has spoken to her. So she's probably a little bit despairing at this point. And what I love about God is that he always has a way of bringing some encouragement into our very difficult situation. So we pick it up in verse eight, and it says, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. So here you have the angel appearing. Let me read verse eight again, because there's something in this. And it says, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. The shepherds are in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And that tells us one thing, one thing very specifically. And the one thing that it tells us is, it's not December. It's not December. Um, many people are surprised to find, let me just show you a couple of pictures. If you go to Israel in December, in the winter, it, it snows. And so here's one picture and then another picture. Everything's covered with snow. And uh, then another picture, everything's covered with snow. So, so now how many of you did not know that it snows in Israel? Okay, good. So we probably grew up in the same church because when, when I was a kid, we had flannel graphs and all the flannel graphs showed that everything was just a desert there with a couple of palm trees. And so, and, and so I grew up and I go to Christian college, I go to seminary and you know, I get out of seminary and somebody comes up to me and says, well, you, you, you know, it, it snows in Israel in the wintertime. I'm like, what is this craziness that you speak of? <laughs> But it really does. So anyways, um, so Jesus was probably born somewhere between April and September, 
but it wouldn't be September because when Caesar has everybody go back to their city of origin, it's gonna be the whole Roman Empire, which is going to involve Europe also. Uh, Caesar might think he's God, but he realizes you're not gonna get all those people to travel through the snow you know, to get back where, you know, to their city of origin. Why do we celebrate Christmas in December? Well, it was actually a pagan holiday, story for another day. It was a pagan holiday, and what happened as the world was becoming more Christian, uh, that pagan holiday was taken and converted and uh, to not celebrate the pagan things anymore, but to celebrate the birth of Christ. And I'm totally okay with that because in reality, all of us were pagan, unsaved, unconverted, but there came a point where we were converted, we were saved. Once we became saved, it's still us, it's still us, but now we're used for a completely different purpose. And it's the same thing for that holiday. We're not celebrating what they celebrated. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus. Does that make sense? So I'm completely okay with that. So the angel appears to the shepherds. Now, what hits me is that the angel does not appear to those who would not make room for Mary at the inn. And the angel does not appear to those who would not drop everything and come help this woman give birth. And the angel does not appear uh, to the family members who are rejecting her story at this point. And sadly, what we find is that all of those who wouldn't believe, they miss out on a great blessing that God has. So God sends the angels to appear to the shepherds. And so you have the shepherds in the field, verse nine, and an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, shone, shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of a great joy, which will be for all the people. And I want to come back to that, that, that verse. So this is going to be for all the people. I, I put verse 10 on your outline because there's something that sometimes we read that and, and we miss. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for I bring you Good news, and I just want to highlight that the word there for good news is yuang galizo, of great joy. The word great there is megas. We would say mega, mega, joy, which will be for all the people. Now, we, we read that in, in, uh, in English, and sometimes we miss something. The word there, yuang galizo, um, means to announce good news, especially the gospel. As a matter of fact, um, the word there, good news, is actually the same word as gospel, gospel. So much so that some translations will translate that verse differently and they will say, I didn't put it on your outline, it's on the screen. The angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I preach to you the gospel of great joy, which shall be for all people. So the word gospel and, and good news and and uh, you know, is all the same, the same word. If you say gospel, it come from euangelion, and this one is euglizo, it's a slightly different declension, but the same word. And it's a mega joy. And so I want you to write down that the angel announced the gospel of mega joy, mega joy. If the gospel that you have received does not bring you mega joy, it could very well be that you didn't actually receive the gospel that the Bible actually talks about because it's supposed to be the gospel of mega joy. And if you're like me, and I grew up in church, when we would talk about the gospel, like if you were to come to our Sunday school class, we'd, you know, what do you think about the gospel? Oh, it's the gospel's the most wonderful thing ever. And, but if you pressed, and, and we'd say, well, is it really the gospel of mega joy? We'd say, well, no, I don't know that I would describe it as a gospel of mega joy, um, because the truth is, growing up in church, it seemed like it was more of a burden than joy. And some of my friends growing up over time, because of the gospel that they received, they said, I just can't do it. I just, I just can't do it. And so they walked away. They walked away from the faith because the gospel that they were told about was not the gospel of mega joy. It was very, very different. You see, 
the gospel that I received growing up as a child seemed to be a gospel that was against everything. And it was presented um, as though God was mad at everyone and everything. So early in my childhood growing up, the pastor would get up, and I wouldn't say that he screamed at us, but there was a lot of yelling and finger pointing. How many of you come from a church background like that? Yeah, so we didn't grow up thinking that it's the gospel of mega joy. It was more of the gospel of mega burden, mega burden rather than than uh, mega joy. And I loved God, and and I you know I didn't want to go to hell, but the the reality is the gospel that I received was not something that brought mega joy. It wasn't until years later that I began to grow in my understanding that the gospel that I had received, the good news of mega joy, um, uh, that gospel that they gave me as a child growing up wasn't actually the gospel that this book talks about. So it's supposed to bring mega joy. So here, here's what I would say to you. If the gospel that you've believed in or you've been hesitant to embrace has not brought you mega joy, then stick around in the gospel of Luke because we're gonna see time and time and time again why it's the gospel of mega joy, not the gospel of mega burden. Does that make sense? So, so stick around. Well, verses 11 and 12, it says, for today in the city of David, there has been born to you a savior who is Christ the Lord. They would understand Christ the Lord, that God has just been born in Bethlehem. He's a baby, but he's fully God. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger and lying in a manger. The reason it's a sign is you didn't typically find babies lying in a feeding trough. And so this is going to be the sign. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on the earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now, every translation will say that slightly different. Um, Others suggest uh, peace on earth with God is pleased with those who are pleasing to him, but each translation will be slightly different. Verse 15. Now, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and I've underlined the baby as he lay in a manger. Typically don't find babies lying in a feeding trough. Now, when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it, all who heard it, we'll talk about that, wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. It's been a tough night for Mary. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. In verse 18, it says, and all who heard it, you know, all who heard it wondered. And you have Mary and she's in a field, in a cave, we don't know. Um, but the baby is lying in a feeding trough. And so here you have everybody in from out of town. They're being registered. And so the shepherds would not come into Bethlehem during this time because just you know they just wouldn't be able to get in. And so the, the shepherds hear this. And so they say, let's go. So we don't know how many shepherds, 10, 20, we, we, we don't really know. Could be a few hundred sheep. It could be a few thousand sheep. But when they come into town, it's quite a ruckus. And so it apparently draws the attention of some of the other people who are around. And so when they show up, people are curious. Why did the shepherds show up here? And so when they begin to explain what's taken place, people begin to wonder. And so some suggest that it could be at this point where Joseph's family, who's not been part of this at all, because Mary's somewhat of an embarrassment, or Mary's family, as they hear what's going on, what the angel said, it could be at this point that all of a sudden they begin to think, well, maybe, maybe we've missed it. Maybe we've missed it. Maybe there's something going on here. We don't know. That's some conjecture. But here's what we do know. Write this down. God doesn't immediately change the circumstances, but sends comfort in the circumstances. 
Mary and Joseph's circumstances are going to change dramatically as we go through the rest of the chapter next week. But right now, there's just encouragement in the circumstances. As, as we close this today, I would just want to say to you that for some of us, we're going through some very difficult situations, some things that we don't understand, we don't know why, we can't fix it. Uh, we know that, that we look at our lives, there's not this glaring sin and so we're wondering, Lord, what, what is going on? It could very well be that what you are going through right now is the very thing that God wants to use in your life to bring you to just the right place that you need to be to do his work in you, ultimately to do his work through you. But in order for that to take place, we have to do what Mary did. Mary chose that she was going to be faithful to the Lord walk with the Lord, represent him, even when it didn't make sense and even if other people around didn't understand. It's so when you come to that place, and that's where God begins to work in our lives and begins to do something. And again, as I said earlier, we could stand up here right now and so many of us could stand up and talk about, I went through this, I don't know why I went through it, this was going on, I couldn't fix it, couldn't change it, but then when it was over, I was able to look back and say, Lord, now I understand why I walked through that, what you were doing. If that's you today, I would encourage you, stay faithful, hang on to the Lord. God might be doing something bigger than what you can currently see right now. Does that make sense? Yes. And so with that, we're gonna go ahead and close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, right now, as we, we wrap this up, we pray that, um, Lord, I know, you know, we know. There are so many of us who are here today who are walking through some circumstances we don't understand and, and people around us don't understand and we can't fix it. And, and yet we can't shake the fact that you are somehow involved in these circumstances. And so our desire right now is to trust you even though we can't see how it's going to work out and to trust that you are doing something and that you are going to do something and somehow, some way, in a way that we can't even see right now, you're gonna get us to just the right place where we need to be in order for you to do your greatest work in us and ultimately through us. And so we commit to that right now. Lord, I thank you for this congregation and I pray, God, that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.